Hello, <clears throat> my name's Freya, Freya Bales, and it's my absolute pleasure to be able to explore an aspect of music cognition that has for a really long time fascinated me, namely creative musical imagery. Um, I hope to spend my talk exploring the creative potential and creative uses of imagining music, reflecting on the ways in which imagining music might liberate or maybe constrain our musical creativity. Uh, so first of all, a definition of musical imagery, what do I mean? So I define musical imagery as being conscious awareness, so conscious, endogenous, so generated by ourselves, it isn't externally in our environment, in a hearing of a mental representation of music. In other words, it's that experience of imagining the sounds of music, as well as, as we might see, other aspects as well of music. <laughs> Normally I go straight on to give me examples of what I might mean by this, um, because I just think it's the easiest way to explain. So one way of thinking about musical imagery and the one that I think is most commonly experienced is to think of when we get music maybe stuck in our heads that may well go round on a loop, colloquially known as earworms. Yet as musicians, we experience musical imagery too. So when we recall music, very often we'll have a musical image. Um, so um, that can be useful if we're playing by ear, for example. Or in a slightly less common um, instance of maybe silent school reading, if people, if people do that, um, then that we're, we're translating essentially the score in front of us into a mental image of that music, that's musical imagery. Moving on to mental rehearsal. So this is something that, again, we might we might well do as performers. We might have a mentally run through the music in our mind's ear. On to finally imagining maybe new musical patterns in the mind's ear. So through composition or maybe related to improvisation too. And this arrow here is really meant to illustrate a shift from mental imagery proper through to imagination. So a more creative mental ability in a more creative and novel um, form and instance of, of musical imagery. And my talk today is going to be focusing on the role of imaginative musical imagery in creative practice, such as composition and to a lesser extent, performance. And musical imagery has received relatively little critical study with respect to musical creation. There's been a lot more research that's looking at musical imagery, for example, um, through earworms and that kind of thing. Um, right, so moving on. To Miles Davis saying, quote, be ready to play what you know and play above what you know. Now, I'm not sure that this is a trivial thing to, a trivial um, piece of advice or instruction. And the question that we're going to be looking at is how do musicians reach beyond what they know, beyond their existing representations of sound to imagine the unknown? Well, why would we want to research this topic? Why study imaginative musical imagery? Well, because we can use that to inform the effective teaching of creative practice, thinking about composition, improvisation, but also to have a better understanding of the imaginative potential of mental rehearsal, um, relevant from artists through to athletes. Also, I think it's an important point to make that we're not just talking about some kind of musical elite here. Um, we know that people experience musical imagery in an everyday basis, um, for example, through earworms, but it doesn't always have to be that when we experience music in our mind's ear, that we're imagining the latest you know, track that's in the charts that we've heard recently. Sometimes some people do report imagining their own um, compositions as we'll see later on today. I also think that musical imagery is fascinating because of course it is dynamic, it is temporally unfolding. Um, some of the research looking at visual imagery is more concerned with um, a mental image of a static um, object, for example, whereas music has this presents this extra challenge and this extra dimension of being necessarily unfolding over time. And finally, because we know that musical imagery can be triggered by our physiological state as well as mental processes too. Okay, so 
We don't know very much about creative musical imagery, but what we do have is a fair amount of anecdote. And um, anecdotal accounts of composition suggest that the ability to imagine novel musical patterns in the form of musical imagery can play an important role in the creative process. Um, and so I'm thinking about a chapter written by Rosemary Mountain that really reported many, uh, many such anecdotes, um, and also a chapter that I co-authored with Laura Bishop, um, where we looked at some of this too. But there was also um, a study by Bennett um, from 1976, who interviewed eight composers. <clears throat> and the experience of musical dreams was raised as well. So we can think about creative musical imagery through dreaming. One thing that occurs in this, um, in, in this writing and in this sort of popular notion sometimes of the way that people might be inspired to, to compose and write new music um, is this notion that our imagination allows us to be free, that when we are imagining music, we can free ourselves of the physical constraints of the physical world in which we are grounded, very much so. And indeed Schumann, Robert Schumann is said to have described his inner musical hearing as being the quote, finer spirit. And that comes from uh, writing by Agnew from 1922, which was all about the auditory imagery of great composers. And Schumann's said to have said, when you begin to compose, do it all with your brain. Do not try the piece at the instrument until it is finished. Okay, so it's quite a, quite a strict uh, ruling there. And Berlioz is said to have um, described the piano as being the grave of original thought. And indeed, Berlioz is um, and then indeed also um, Bennett's talking about um, the piano is too limiting, um, as said by a composer interviewed by Bennett. So we're getting some quite, uh, quite strict notions, quite rigid notions here about um, how a reliance on the physical, physical world around us in order to, to be creative musically um, might be a mistake and maybe we need to be having greater recourse to our finer spirit. And just to um, finish um, with the quotes from composers, um, for now anyway, um, here's a quote by Elgar cited by, by Buckley from um, his book from 1912. And here Elgar is said to have um, said the, the following. The fact is I mentally hear the instruments and when scoring put down what I feel that the sentiment of the words, if there be words, demands for the most perfect expression attainable. So far as I am concerned, the thing is already complete in my mind. To make others feel it as I do is the trouble. If I could only write as fast as I think. So interesting. Now, as I've said already a couple of times, there isn't so much research that's looked at the creative use of musical imagery. But what we can do is we can look for lessons in the research that's been done um, through general psychology into visual imagery. And Chavez presents the argument that mental imagery is a core process in creativity. But general psychology has really focused its attention on visual imagery and its functional role in problem solving rather than on the role of mental imagery or in our case musical imagery in artistic practice. So what I've done on this slide is I've done a bit of a comparison between what we know about visual imagery and innovation and generating new ideas through mental imagery and what we know or what we can guess about musical imagery and innovation for a bit of a comparison. So I've already mentioned the use of visual imagery for problem solving. What about musical imagery? Um, well in the sense in which I am thinking about it, the goal is quite different. This is much more about artistic, aesthetic, maybe even emotion regulation goals Perhaps they differ from standard accounts of problem solving, though that's not to say that we can't think about problem solving as being an integral part of um, creative musical imagery. From visual imagery research um, is the gene pool model. This is the idea that visual imagery can be useful for both generative and exploratory processes um, when we're, we're being creative. 
Um, and I've already mentioned that there are cognitive implications, I think, from the dynamic and temporal properties of musical imagery, which might be an extra consideration, certainly compared to earlier research on visual imagery, which was a little bit more preoccupied with static images than um, a temporal unfolding and a dynamic sequence. We know from research into visual imagery that recent experience influences our imaginative creation. So we're quite influenced by what we've just experienced. Um, but we also know that recent musical experience shapes musical creations to musical creations. So there's some similarities there. We know from visual imagery research that expert knowledge is useful for image exploration. So if we have particular expertise in, in the visual dimension, then that's helpful. But we also know that the same is true with musicians. Musicians are better at musical image exploration than non-musicians. So continuing in the same vein, <coughs> excuse me. Continuing then in the same vein of reflecting on what we might learn from visual imagery research, I'm bridging the gap by considering the role of visual imagery now in visual art. We're going to be looking at some ideas by Ainsworth Land. Born Ainsworth Land was concerned with modeling the development of creativity from the perspective of art and identified four stages of growth. Mental imagery was incorporated into Ainsworth Land's stage development model as set out in this table and discussed in my chapter with Laura Bishop. So I'll just go through the four orders of development um, that are set out by Ainsworth Land um, as they relate to mental imagery. So first order imaging would be um, spontaneous if I, for example, suddenly had a mental image of of a chair as a chair that I know it's direct representation. It's in that sense realistic and it's concrete. Second order imaging. Let me think of an example. <laughs> um, comfortable, predictable, awareness of ability to manipulate and control. So I might um, in my second order imaging of this chair, imagine somebody now pushing it over. Right, so I am manipulating that um, intentionally so, um, but there's a, an element of compar being comparative between the chair's position initially and as it lands on the floor once it's been kicked over. Third order imaging then in terms of visual imagery, this is more abstract, symbolic maybe, superimposing of mental images, perhaps metaphorical, controlled and spontaneous. So we can be thinking in terms of an artistic trajectory more along the lines of if you were to, to design your own drawing, um, but in a very intentional way, in a goal directed way. And then finally, the fourth order is all about renunciation of control. Um, it can be chaotic, psychedelic, illuminating, and there's a, a big emphasis in this fourth order of imaging on receptivity to unconscious material. So it's really important to explain that these uh, different orders are not tied to specific periods of an individual's development, rather they potentially operate at all stages of life as appropriate to whatever the creative task at hand is. So in our chapter, along with um, Laura Bishop, we use the stage development model as a broad framework to describe various uses of musical imagery and composition. And we skip the first order <clears throat> because this signifies really just like, the most basic representation of sensory information. So akin to a memory image of a particular sound, let's say. So um, second order imaging then, as this might apply to music, um, Creative imaging at this level um, is said to be goal directed and um, involves the conscious manipulation of given material. Um, as Ainsworth Land writes here, it is the intent, improving, strengthening, extending, modifying, that is more significant than the imaginal content. So as I say, then Im imaging at this level is um, really retains key properties of the original product, if you like. Um, so thinking about applying this to music, what might that look like? Well, in performance, it very often is the case that we want to develop our own interpretation of a piece of music, and we might even mentally rehearse that. So that would be a good example of second order imaging. Um, and then at times, musical imagery can serve as a mental playback of ideas that might have been created during composition too. 
and Retra conducted a study of composers as part of their um, master's dissertation, um, asking them to provide verbal commentary in a compositional task during which they were not allowed any access to an instrument. So they had no means to actually physically hear back their compositional ideas other than mentally. And um, their analysis revealed that um, they were really making a conscious use of musical imagery at moments of decision making. And that really chimes well with um, ideas of Penrose, who talks about using mental imagery um, as a conscious processing at stage of eliminating ideas between different creative possibilities. And um, composer Jane Stanley has written a blog reflecting on the ways in which the stage development model applies to her work. And she describes being aware of consciously replaying ideas in her mind and um, intervening mentally with variations, I think she says, to try and test and extend an idea. So that's very much a second order type of imaging. So third order imaging, um, as I say, characterized as abstract, symbolic, etc. Um, this is intentional and goal directed, but also about the ability to spontaneously receive um, unconscious material. <clears throat> And this combination of the old and the new um, is implied by the third order. And I think it's encapsulated really well by the words of composer Henry Cowell here. <clears throat> I'm going to read this out. I think this is my favorite quote. Every conceivable tone quality and beauty of nuance, every harmony and disharmony, or any number of simultaneous melodies can be heard at will by the trained composer. He can hear not only the sound of any instrument or combination of instruments, but also an almost infinite number of sounds which cannot as yet be produced on any instrument. Wow, um, <laughs> certainly I can't do this. Um, and I think that Cowell's words here are really, really relate to that prevalent idea we've spoken about, that musical imagery can somehow be equated with imaginative freedom. Indeed, Cowell describes the composer's mind as, quote, the most perfect instrument in the world, um, end quote, since it's both veridical in its representation of existing sound and supposedly limitless in its capacity to hear the new, um, it, hear in the sense of if in imagination. And I think that Cowell's statement here really communicates an optimistic belief that the compositional mind is, is liberated from the constraints of more earthly instruments. I quite like that. So now on to fourth order imaging. Um, and this shares the property of spontaneity with um, first order musical imagery actually, but on a much higher level of creative development, um, making fourth order musical imagery um, comparable to inspiration. Now, inspiration in composition is frequently confused with musical imagery. And Rosemary Mountain observes that, um, quote, the myths that surround the one have confused investigation of the other, end quote. And one of these myths, I think, is that inspiration takes the form of a complete and pure auditory image to be translated in some kind of sequential manner from the mind to the page. Um, in reality, Research by Mountain suggests that composers are more likely to have been working on music for a while, perhaps progressing through the lower orders of the stage development model, modifying and developing a mental image rather than transcribing one in, in virgin form. Now, this alternation between unconscious and conscious thought seems to be at the root of many misconceptions regarding the role of inspiration and the role of assimilation. Although inspiration may strike as a seemingly complete idea, it's likely to be based on the unconscious amalgamation of, of our musical experience. And today I'm going to be reflecting on the nature of this assimilated musical experience, and thus what the basis is maybe for these moments of inspiration. And Agnew describes the creative process as being the quote, the conscious maturing of thought through mental saturation with sound images close quotes. But where do these sound images come from? 
there's relatively little music cognition research that relates to inspiration in the context of composition and a surprising dearth of research relating to the cognitive activity that's entailed in composition as pointed out by Schiavio et al from 2020. Moreover, we know remarkably little about mental imagery for newly created music rather than as a memory image. But what do we know? Well, there have been some empirical studies that relate to different ways of thinking about creative musical imagery. So, for example, um, in my study from 2015, I was interested in the everyday experiences of imagining music um, of everyday people. So I was not looking at um, people who were musically trained. Um, and I used experience sampling methods, so people were being asked to report on what their current um, mental imagery was um, each time they were contacted. And eight out of 47 of the participants in the study reported imagining their own compositions, yet they, these were not people who were musically trained. So I think that that's, that's worth saying. Um, I've also been involved in a, a project which um, has not been written up for publication where I was interested in exploring possible links between the extent and nature of um, imagining music in everyday life, um, as that might relate to our propensity for associative thinking. In other words, those links that we might make between different ideas um, and the extent to which the musical imagery that we might experience in everyday life might have a more creative element to it. And then another study I wanted to talk about and mention was work again by, by Laura Bishop, um, myself and Roger Dean, which was uh, really all about trying to understand imagining expressive, expressive properties um, of music during piano performance. So as performing, the extent to which we're able to do draw on our mental image of music um, for particularly um, for formulation of expressive um, features of the music. So all of the studies that I've mentioned on this slide um, are all um, collecting quantitative data. And of course, that approach takes a really important role, and rightly so, in cognitive science. And it represents most of my personal projects as well. However, my interest in musical imagery began way back when I was taking my master's um, in music psychology and then my PhD at the University of Sheffield. I was inspired by Andrea Holpen's uh, seminal research on musical imagery, and I undertook a series of studies some of which were experimental designs, but others were more exploratory because I was keen to try and learn more about musicians' first-hand experiences of musical imagery in their creative practice. And so um, I interviewed three different uh, classical musicians. One was a composer, one was a pianist, and one was a profoundly deaf organist and pianist. And the aim of the interviews was very explicitly to explore emergent themes that related to the relationship between musical imagery and musical perception. Now, I'm not going to um, talk about all of my findings, but I have pulled out three themes and selected three themes from my findings that I wanted to talk about today because of their relevance for the topic of this talk. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, avoiding over familiarization with perceived music. Um, this came out from the composer who talked about how uh, musical imagery could be important because um, if you're listening to what you're writing too much or if you're getting it down on score too soon, there was a sense in which that might limit your potential to, to grow your ideas. Whereas by using your musical imagery, um, it, it's less fixed um, and you're not becoming overly familiar with the sonic result. Um, so that was put forward by the composer and, re and a related point by the pianist was um, that they tended to try and avoid listening to other pianists renditions of pieces that they were working on because they didn't want to be influenced um, by that. And so they would uh, instead draw on their own mental image for the music. Another key idea that came out um, from these interviews was this notion of balancing the musical idea without it becoming stuck in notation or perception. And that was put forward by the composer. So by deliberately um, using your musical imagery rather than, um, again, 
putting it down in notation or actually performing it or getting it into the computer, um, it, it, it's not going to be stuck. It's going to somehow have an aspect of, of freshness as well. And then the composer also explained that musical imagery was a little bit like a faulty tape, but in a good way, um, because there's a sense in which it's, it's inability to really be as lifelike and as uh, have that fidelity of, of real music meant that it actually afforded experimentation and modification too. <clears throat> Um, of course, there have been others with an interest in the processes and experiences of the creative cognition of composers, though without an explicit focus on musical imagery, and that includes um, Andrea Schiavio and colleagues from 2020, who interviewed seven Western classical composers, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to return to some of their findings later in my talk. But I first wanted to take a moment to emphasize just how stimulating I actually found it to uncover these themes um, on this slide here, <clears throat> relating to some of the ways in which musical imagery can serve to limit or liberate creative practice in this early PhD work of mine, which I subsequently wrote up as a book chapter in 2009. Now, a scholar who has conducted excellent qualitative research in order to better understand people's experiences of musical imagery is Erki Huovinen, who will be describing his method in this afternoon's workshop. So I wanted to put in a plug for this. <laughs> OK, so. Um, Professor Hovinen is going to be talking about the elicitation interview method as applied to musical imagery. Um, the elicitation interview is a way of focusing on and reenacting aspects of experience. And it's an approach to understanding first person phenomena um, that is able to um, take it above and beyond that for a more systematic comparison and observation between first person accounts. Um, so it's ultimately, it's the use of a second person method to study consciousness. And this use of second person methods is, is becoming increasingly um, common. So I, for one, <laughs> would be really excited to um, use this approach to see what emerges as common to the role of musical imagery in creative practice. Um, and um, and Erki spoke about this method in, in this paper from 2019, published in Music Perception, all about pleasant musical imagery, um, eliciting cherished music in the second person. So I recommend it as a read. I also um, look forward to seeing you all a bit later this afternoon at the workshop. Um, having said all of this, one challenge when researching creative musical imagery is the ephemeral quality of the experience. And this composed methodological challenges relating to the slipperiness of the experience when trying to interrogate what one is hearing in imagination, but also in terms of its transience too, and in terms of whether it stands up to scrutiny, something which is quite, quite nebulous. And so reflecting on some of my own research, <clears throat> When respondents in my experience sampling study, the one that was reported in Bales 2015, um, when they reported imagining their own compositions, were they really? Or were they imagining something that they'd heard but failed to recognize its origins? And what about extemporization when existing musical material is elaborated upon? How are we able to acknowledge or recognize the role in which that's turned into something new or is in fact something else that we're just imagining in a, with slightly different focus. Or when we remember music inaccurately and it becomes then something else. And musicians I've spoken to um, for the 2009 chapter <clears throat> reported that that ephemeral nature of mental imagery for music is at once a limitation and an advantage. In fact, it's temporary qualities afford change, but our imagination is not endless because it is shaped by our musical experiences and our habitual cognition and much as I wish I had an imagination like Henry Cowell's I certainly for one don't. <clears throat> okay so we're going to move on slightly to look at the role of the body and look at what our habitual experience might be. Excuse me I've got a very dry throat. <clears> throat> not used to this much talking. Okay <clears throat> 
So in 2019, I wrote a chapter for the Oxford Handbook of Sound and Imagination, emphasizing the multimodality of our imagery for music. Put simply, when we experience music, we experience more than an auditory signal. Bodies are involved in the production and perception of music, and many scholars have reflected on how mental imagery might relate to our embodied experiences too. So here are just a few different um, bits of writing that I've pulled together as being relevant for this topic of thinking about embodiment and mental imagery. So I'd like to start with um, talking about some of the work um, and ideas by uh, Raybrook on experiential cognition. And Raybrook writes about how representation of the world is generated by an interaction between environmental inputs and our capacity to represent it. So very much thinking in, in cognitive terms in some sense there. And bodies, of course, are our most immediate environments in a way. So our physicality governs this interaction. And so then moving on to embodied cognition and um, particularly focusing in on this uh, seminal work by Varela et al from 1991, who argue that minds depend on bodies which are characterized by certain sensory motor capacities. Um, and that embodied therefore means reflection in which body and mind have been brought together. So by this argument, the apparently disembodied mental simulation of sensory motor experience is necessarily conditioned by our physical experiences of the world. And I, I suspect that these ideas are not new to anybody in the room and nor am I claiming um, that they are mine, uh, absolutely not. And these are well-established ideas by now. Um, so, but to apply these ideas from embodied cognition, um, we're also going to start by considering the relationship between perception and action. So um, perceptions influence, are influenced by the possible actions that um, are afforded would be an argument from ecological psychology, thinking of the work of Gibson. And also Timothy Hubbard sets this out um, in his chat, in his writing, thinking about the uh, multimodality of auditory imagery. Um, and then again, our very own Andrea Schiavio and colleagues from 2014 um, point out that perceiving the actions of another will activate motor plans of our own. And in this way, listening to music then implies the actions associated with its production. And the motor theory perception um, is, is evoked to explain the influence of motor constraints on our representations of verbal stimuli. For example, again, this is uh, the writings of, of Timothy Hubbard. And um, this can be extended to account for our findings of activation of the motor cortex in both covert speech and in song. So looking at that, that broader literature relating to our um, representations of sound um, in the context of, of speech as well as song. So um, ultimately, I think we're starting to stray now into the realms of auditory imagery specifically. So we are moving into this perception action imagery relationship. Um, and Raybrook, again, back to, back to Raybrook, has said, quote, perception can be considered a simulated action as imagining the actions that are implied in using the perceived objects. It follows then, and to quote Godoy, that images of sound production, including visual, motor, tactile, etc., elements, may actually trigger images of sound. And conversely, that images of sound may trigger images of sound production. <clears throat> so what I hope to have set up here is the intrinsically multimodal nature of mental imagery, including, and perhaps particularly for musical imagery, so can we ever really use our imagination to escape from our bodies? So from limitations, musical imagery is formed in response to our musical and physical environment is the argument. And music perception and production, we know from research, I'm thinking about research by Patel, but also Huronen and Olin, um, 
there's some really fascinating research suggesting links between um, the the uh, linguistic environments in which we we grow up um, and in which we're, we're with which we're enculturated and how some of the prosodic patterns that we perceive through our language composers from that culture then go on to um, mirror those prosodic patterns in their instrumental writing so not even songs so there's some fascinating research showing some interesting correlations between linguistic prosodic patterns and then the rhythms um, and patterns that tend to make it into um, instrumental compositions. So there is this environmental influence on, on, on compositional language. Um, there's also some evidence that mental images of tones from middle C to, to the B above and, and from white keys on the piano are generated faster than mental images of other tones and black keys by pianists with absolute pitch. And that's, that's a conference paper by Stelzer and colleagues um, that I found particularly interesting. Um, and another, another sort of, if you like, limitation or constraint um, to what, what it is that we imagine can be related back to the research on visual imagery and creativity. And um, Fink has done a lot of work in this area. And I'm reminded of work um, by Fink where participants were maybe um, told to draw a beak, um, but otherwise given free reign. Um, and most might have also chosen to draw feathers in their artistic representations. So there are these co-occurrences and patterns that we pick up on, um, associations that um, shape the way that we um, produce new mental images, is my argument here. Um, it hardly seems possible to invent a musical idea in a contextual void. Of course, we need to have context. Um, so the paradox then is that maybe it seems as though the greater the exposure to a musical stimulus or a type of musical genre or tradition through listening and imagining, then maybe the greater the likelihood of assimilating that, that um, input, the idea wholesale or incorporating it in part as part of a schematic representation of musical experience. Well, this isn't then imagination. Rather, that would just, if it was just like that, it would just be like the regurgitation of pre-existing musical thought. So what is the role then, if any, of our embodied musical imagery in creation? And so we can revisit our question from the start um, today. How do musicians reach beyond their existing embodied representations of sound to imagine the unknown? So I propose that we re revisit now Ainsworth Land's stage development model of creativity with this embodied perspective in mind. And I think actually it's not going to be a difficult job. I think it's going to be quite easy to do that. Um, I think it's easy enough to review this model um, through the lens of embodied cognition um, and embodiment. So um, we can think about a first order example of an embodied musical image. It could well be imagining ourselves um singing singing a note um so that would be direct representation realistic and it's got that embodied element second order then um so this is a conscious manipulation of given material again this is about the intent um and back to the quote from Ainsworth land it's the intent improving strengthening extending modifying that's more significant than the imaginal content. So we can think back to our examples from performance. Um, so when we might use musical imagery in, in generating our own mental representation of the interpretation that we want to, to be performing of a particular piece of music um, or mentally rehearsing it. So I think that um, an embodied view of this is absolutely, absolutely right. Um, <laughs> I'd say that it's um, possibly quite difficult to, to strip out the physical dimensions of a mental image for this, indeed. Um, and some performance traditions place um, a great deal of um, emphasis and weight on 
very deliberately stepping away from the instruments in order to really um, refine that mental image for the music, but in a way which incorporates the, the physicality. So I'm thinking of um, a paper by Davidson Kelly et al from 2015, where they, they, they did a, a case study of um, advanced pianists taking um, a course workshop with um, um, Nelly, uh, well, the name's gone, they'll come back to me, um, with a, a pianist whose approach um, and, and training approach is very much to have musicians working away from the instrument um, and, and working on their mental image of the music and working on their interpretation through, through, through imagining it. Um, and the idea is that um, by focusing on the, the goal, the goal of the of the performance and focusing on that and what it is that you're wanting to achieve through your your musical creation, um, you're able to um, cut straight to the the action that is needed because you have learned to produce such sounds on the piano through that physical action. Um, it's like a shortcut in a way. So that's an interesting article for, for, for anyone who wants to know more about that. But thinking about a second order example of composition, um, this then would be the use of conscious musical image, for example, at moments of decision-making. And I think, again, that makes sense if we add the embodied element to it. I think we can certainly think about um, composing a piece of music and, and having to make decisions by imagining the music and thinking through what might be physically possible um, or, or um, particularly desirable or idiomatic. Um, thinking about the physicality of playing that. So I think that, that we can see how that comes in in that sense. Um, moving on now to think about third order imaging. So just to remind you then third order creativity is an imaging that requires a change of perception. Um, so it's about um, looking through and into ideas um, and breaking up one's existing perceptual set. And this is a quote, um, push against the limits of normal perception, end quote. And I think this seems to relate really well to my interviewees' accounts as to the ways in which musical imagery might serve to free our imagination through its inadequacies, actually, as, as a first order wax tablet representation. So if, if it were to really function as a, as a faithful playback, um, it would be direct representation and realistic, that would be first order, but that simply is not the reality of the way in which um, we were able to um, mentally play music back. After all, imagining music is very different from hearing that music, it is not the same thing. Um, so, you know, the, the interviewees accounts really speak to this, I think. Um, and also the, the problems that were expressed with um, having the, the fixity of a recording or a score, that, that can really not be particularly beneficial. It can maybe stifle creativity. So by having your um, musical imagination in, engaged in this third order um, imaging in a very embodied sense, I think, yeah, I think that sounds absolutely right. And thinking about the embodied elements and thinking about a lot of experimental composition is very often concerned with considerations of materiality and extended techniques as well, and breaking down boundaries of what is actually physically achievable. So we can, we can test that and we can push that and we can deliber deliberately work against it. And maybe our musical imagination is a way into that, that approach. Um, and then as for fourth order um, imaging in the context of um, musical creativity and our embodied cognition, then I see no reason why aspects of that inspiration, if that's the form it takes, um, would, would re not relate to the physical um, dimensions of sound production just as much as the other aspects of music making from the sound through to visual dimensions and, and any, any of the senses involved in that. Okay, in fact, thinking, thinking about um, 
synesthetic connections and and um, going beyond the metaphor of third order, but actually to genuine connections across modalities, um, I'm sure is a big part of the sorts of um, ideas that we might we might characterize as being fourth order imaging. Right, so all of this has been a big thought exercise. <laughs> um, I should have started off with a bit of reflexivity and uh, setting out my stories to who I am in terms of my own musical backgrounds. You will by now have gathered I am not a composer, <laughs> nor am I an improviser. Um, I am a performer, I'm an oboe player. Um, so so um, my examples are probably going to be somewhat more <laughs> accurate and relatable when it comes to performance than composition so so now you know uh, moving on to liberation we've talked about um limitations and now we're moving on to liberation gosh it's very dark now that the screen is black um okay so i'd like to spend some time reflecting on a couple of theories that i find compelling when it comes to the defense, if you like, for a position that musical imagery can in many ways free us uh, creatively, all while acknowledging the centrality of our cognitive mindsets. And I'd like to start by talking about the possibilistic model of consciousness. Um, and here's a quote from O'Connor and Ardema about the possibilistic model of consciousness. They write that consciousness presents the world in different degrees of possibility never a certainty. Okay, so according to the possibilistic model of consciousness, intentional space between an individual and their world does not simply exist, it needs to be, quote, filled up creatively. So applied to the act of musical composition, this suggests a scenario in which we creatively explore musical possibilities and in cases in which music is not physically present in our environment, we may imaginatively fill the void by immersion in, in our world of possibilities through musical imagery. And the filling of such a musical void can occur unintentionally, as in the phenomenon actually of an earworm that, that springs to mind or the occurrence of a moment of inspiration at the other extreme. Or it could be the intentional dedication of conscious thought to composition, similar to those second and third order um, stages of the stage development model. And now to move on to the second theory that really interests me um, related to the topic of, of today's um, session. Um, and to talk a little bit about perceptual activity theory. So today I have been thinking about musical imagery in imaginative terms, i.e. as the inventive manipulation of musical imagery that happens to share many of the constraining properties of perception. Our accumulated knowledge forms a probability map or mental schema. Amalgamating ideas from, from NYSA and um, ecological psychology, perceptual activity theory, quote, is experienced when a schema that is not directly relevant to the exploration of the current environment is allowed at least partial control of the exploratory apparatus, end quote. Well, there is a wealth of neuroimaging data that now exists to support auditory imagery as being a form of covert perceptual processing. I'm thinking about work by Robert Zatore and, and, and others that, that has um, found evidence of this. And Thomas, um, the, the author of the quote on the slide here, describes visual imagination as our potential to see as. And imagination involves seeing as or interpreting in a new way. And this allows us therefore to change perspective. And visual researchers have studied this experimentally by examining our propensity to alter the way in which we perceive ambiguous stimuli. And there's been equivalent research, of course, looking at ambiguous musical stimuli too. Applied to audition then, auditory imagination would be our potential to hear as. And this is precisely what Schumann is reported to have done when hearing piano music as an orchestra in his mind's ear. He's hearing as. So to both, to my mind, both of the theories um, on this slide here with the possibilistic model of consciousness and perceptual activity theory 
um, both of them speak of the creative affordances of imagery, active exploration and freedom. Exploration and musical discovery emerged as themes in the previously mentioned interview study um, with the seven different classical composers conducted by Andrea Schiavio um, and colleagues. So too did the theme of physicality and imagination. So there's some commonality in terms of their findings as well from their research, um, this importance of exploration and uh, the importance of physicality and imagination. And I would like to suggest that while our musical imagery is driven by co cognitive processes necessarily, and of course our embodied experience of music, the lack of certainty inherent in our, in our mental representations of music affords exploration. It's that very lack of certainty that affords exploration and is therefore necessarily creative. So to return to the title of my talk today, uh, musical imagery, freedom or constraint in the creative process. Um, I, I love this quote from Marc Lamont, who says, imagery is free because it is not driven by the outer environment, constrained because it is first embedded in a space that was first molded by the outer environment, and secondly, subject to autonomous processing. So this is just in its both there. Who knew? <laughs> So let's explore these two sides now, constraint and freedom. So constraint, we can think of, if you like, in the sense that the raw materials, the fodder, um, is largely shaped by environmental factors. We also know from some really interesting research that mental imagery can actually inhibit perception too. So it can actually um, alter um, and negatively impact on the way that we experience the world. And I see a really good example of this sometimes in uh, our performance students um, who might have a really, really clear mental image of what they're striving to achieve in their performance. They've got a very clear notion of the different expressive qualities they want to communicate um, to the extent that they don't hear where their performance is perhaps there's a shortfall there in that it isn't actually matching their mental image, but because they're superimposing their mental image of how they want the, the music to sound and how in their mind's ear it does, they're maybe not so sensitive to um, some of the ways in which their performance could do with a little, a little more work to um, reach their, their creative aspirations. Um, and also, it's fair to say that um, if we were just to sit down and compose mentally um, without testing physically any of our, our ideas, of course, that's actually a really resource intensive activity in terms of our cognitive resources. So when it comes to freedom, though, of course, we're free to imagine when we like. We don't need to go and find that piano, which is the grave of original thought. Um, we can rehearse new combinations of sound without an instrument. Though I'm not sure that I could imagine any sound I, I wished as suggested by Henry Cowell. We're also able to hear as, with that comparison to seeing as, in other words, to interpret. Because just as when we're actually perceiving music and attending to particular aspects, we can attend to different dimensions of our imagined representation as well. And also, our composers and a performer um, suggested that musical imagery can really help us to retain a mental flexibility and perhaps conceptual freshness too. So I thought it would be appropriate to finish my, with the words of a couple of my interviewees from my PhD interviews with musicians, um, the ones that were reported in my 2009 book chapter. So the quote from the top left hand side is from a pianist. Um, who says this, the important thing that you don't want, or I don't want anyway, is a performance that is so completely planned and cut and dried in every detail that it has no possibility of further growth. So this is in relation to um, why a musical image might be useful. And the quote on the right hand side at the bottom is the composer. Um, and um, speaking again of using musical imagery through composition. He says, 
If it's a playback me mechanism, you can't actually be certain that every time it's the same. And I think this is the beauty and the drawback to notation that it actually fixes a version. Whereas, you know, sometimes it's more valuable to try to keep the ideas fluid. So as to the answer to my question today, musical imagery, freedom or constraint in the creative process, I think the answer comes down to perspective and whether you feel that the glass is half full or half empty. And with that, and some images of half full glasses, I would like to acknowledge the work and ideas of Laura Bishop as a co-author on the chapter that has most influenced my talk today. I'd also particularly like to thank all the research participants who so kindly gave up their time to take part in experiments or to share their experiences of creative musical imagery with me. Finally, thank you very much to the symposium organizers for their kind invitation to speak today, namely Tudor Popescu, Andrea Schiavio and Felix Hayduck. It's truly an honor to be involved in this stimulating event and I'm looking forward to um, our discussions today. Thank you very much.